All right, everyone, uh, Bill Hanks here, uh, Dr. Thomas with Human, and uh, we're gonna be talking to KBMO about um, their new uh, COVID-19 uh, diagnostics test for the antibodies with uh, COVID-19. So um, we have the huge honor for them being on this uh, webinar and talking to us about the um, science behind it, getting into the nitty gritty, and just kind of showing why um, you know, this is a great test to be taking and um, why you would want to take um, this test from them as well. Um, but um, first of all, um, I just want to thank you guys so much, Dr. Duvall and James White. Um, James White's CEO and Dr. Duvall is the Chief Scientific Officer for um, KBMO. And um, they're going to get into it. I'm going to hand it over to them. And um, But thank you guys so much for your time. I know it's incredibly busy right now with um, what's going on. And um, I'm sure your lab is busy processing orders and getting um, calls and people wanting to know this and that. But um, I reached out to you guys because um, a referral on the test and then after looking um, into the details and talking to you several times, James. Um, I just knew that this was the right um, organization to go with. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, James, and um, you kind of just give us a little background about um, your organization and, and what it is you guys do. Perfect. So yeah, if you want to pull up that first slide, Bill, that'd be great. All right. Yeah, this is yeah. So, um, so thank you very much indeed. So, uh, thanks for that kind intro. And as I say, we're uh, we're excited to be able to kind of share the information that we have on the testing, uh, and as well, um, Dr. Dorval's uh, you know many years of experience of infectious diseases. Um, so again, probably like most of us on on this call or anyone kind of tuning in, um, five weeks ago we were doing something quite different. Um, we were a food sensitivity company. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, Bill, um, and as part of that. Um, you know, we had a clear high complexity lab. Um, it was an FDA registered manufacturing facility. Uh, and as, uh, as the world changed, we moved away from that food sensitivity test, which was looking at a combination of IgG and complements. So a great way of measuring your kind of immune health to work out which foods are causing inflammation. Clearly, if you, if you can reduce your inflammation on an individualized basis, then that'll improve your immune health. So at some point, um, hopefully as this passes, then that's something we can all be talking about again. But rather than sit on the sidelines and complain that you know the federal or the state level weren't quite getting the testing done as they should have done, um, we jumped in uh, and looked to source um, a test um, out, of, out of China. So we worked with, um, we have a lab in uh, Shanghai and one in Beijing, and both of my partners there recommended that we work with the tests that we've chosen. So. Um, Dr. Dorval will go through the science on that, uh, but again, just wanted to kind of take advantage of the infrastructure that we had in place to make sure that rather than standing on the sidelines complaining, we could jump in and offer the test to as many people as possible, because whether you're you know, head of the WHO, Bill Gates, everyone has recognized that testing is very important to try and work out you know, what's the spread in the community, and so that as we understand that, then we can help kind of implement strategies to help more importantly, above, above everything else, we can get America back to work again. Next slide, please, Bill. Um, so our, our management team, again, the, the key gentleman on this, and, and uh, you'll have the benefit of listening to him next, um, is Dr. Brent Dorval. He's over 30 years experience of uh, infectious disease testing um, was the first man to develop the first rapid HIV diagnostic. Uh, and more importantly, especially given what's going on now, was an advisor to the WHO for vaccines and diagnostics in Geneva. So again, a lot of um, experience of not only running testing, developing testing, launching tests, and looking at, at kind of pandemics um, with his experience with HIV. And that has all been really brought to bear with, again, the choice of the test, and we'll talk about some of the validations we've, we've had in terms of from various organizations. But frankly, for me, the fact that we've got someone with Dr. Dorval's kind of deep knowledge and experience of infectious diseases who's, who's behind this test gives me really the key, uh, the key benefit of, of, of why we should be moving this forward. Uh, next slide, please, Bill. Just briefly about the team. 
Um, we're very used to running tests. As I said, um, we've run, last year we did over two and a half million assays in our facility in Boston. Um, we've geared up and so really we've been running this test now for the last three weeks. Uh, and so again, the guys are in a really good rhythm now. We launched the serum test and we'll talk a little bit more about um, the development that Dr. Dorval's done in terms of the developing the finger stick test, which we launched today and, and go live with. So um, we're well prepared, we're well set up, we have infrastructure in place. As I say, we're very keen to uh, see how we can get America back to work again by offering this antibody test. And at that point, let me hand over to uh, Dr. Dorval uh, and he'll talk about uh, uh, the science about the test and, and how it's working uh, in, in practice. Uh, yes. Uh... Uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for the opportunity to uh, uh, go over our new test uh, at KVMO Diagnostics. Of course, everybody's aware of the current pandemic uh, that's basically uh, got the world engulfed in a, in a firestorm, and that's the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, uh, and what we have is a nice uh, a rapid test, nice assay uh, that will measure uh, IgM and IgG. Uh, that's generated when this uh, virus uh, infects uh, an individual. So first of all, I'd just like to go over just very basics of the virus and, and kind of give you a foothold uh, as to what we're doing and why we're doing it um, and why we're using this particular test. So the uh, coronavirus, it's a, it's a round virus. It's about 150 nanometers, 120 nanometers, depending on where, where you measure it from. Uh, it has several main uh, structural proteins. The one that gives the virus its name, corona, is the spike glycoprotein, S protein. And that also can, that's the yellow uh, spike that's very prominent on this virus. And that contains the receptor binding site for the host cells. So that's responsible for binding to the host cell and basically initiating uh, infection once it gets into the cell. And we can go over that into some detail. Uh, the other uh, protein, the one that we use on the assay is the uh, nuclear protein. And that you, as you can see is inside the virus is a helical nuclear capsid composed of mRNA, which is about 25 kilobases. And what you can't see, it's microscopic on that helical nuclear capsid is the nuclear protein. And if you think of a beaded necklace, it kind of decorates the mRNA much like uh, the beads on a pearl necklace. So this microscopic protein uh, is the one that we uh, detect antibodies to. And the reason we do that is it's the earliest uh, antibody response uh, for, for any protein in this particular virus. Another uh, protein is the envelope protein. It's a much larger protein than what's shown here but that's a very prominent structural protein in this virus. And then the hemagglutinin esterase, that's uh, very uh, analogous to some other viruses like influenza, HIV, and, and the like. Um, and uh, it's an important uh, infectious uh, component of this particular virus. So we're gonna focus from here on out pretty much on the nuclear protein. And in the next slide, what you can see is there's a, several current methods that are used. Isolation and culture, not used very much because it's dangerous and time consuming. Nucleic acid detection, that is the um, favorite one, the so-called the RT-PCR, uh, these uh, genetic tests that measure um, the mRNA of the virus. Again, it's, uh, it's a very good test. The problem is you need, need a, a nasopharyngeal swab, People don't like that very much. Uh, and also it, it detects early infection. So if you miss the window that um, this virus is the, actually infecting the mucosa, then chances are this is gonna be PCR negative. And that simply means that it's too early or too late. And um, as a result, the, uh, you cannot detect the uh, mRNA from this virus and you get uh, a negative result. So just briefly, so the virus infects you uh, in about two or three days, you go through a phase where um, it just sits there kind of quiescent. And then the prodromal phase where this thing starts to replicate like crazy, 
and you see fever and perhaps some other symptoms associated with the infection. That's the phase that you wanna use PCR. You wanna be right in that window. And then shortly thereafter, perhaps a week or two, you're no longer virus positive, it's probably somewhere else, perhaps even the lungs. And so you'll be PCR negative again. So again, I just wanna stress there's a window there and before and after that, there's a chance you're gonna miss it. Uh, antigen detection, again, uh, it's a dangerous technique. You need BL3 level and all kinds of protective gear. So it's a great R&D tool, great research tool, but not used. We're gonna focus on IgM and IgG detection, which is IgM's the earliest antibodies you'll see, and then IgG comes on somewhat later. And then the next slide, uh, this is for uh, SARS-CoV-1. This was the infection that uh, occurred in 2003, 2004 timeframe. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 are very, very uh, closely related. We call them pretty homologous. There's data available for this virus, and as yet, there's not a lot of firm data available for CoV-2, given that it's people are just studying this and trying to sort this out now. But as you can see in the top slide, the N protein, this is for IgG, the N protein comes up, it's the solid line, comes up early, comes up strong, whereas the dashed lines are both the M protein and the S protein. You can see the response is much weaker and uh, it goes away pretty quickly. So the focus is IgG comes up pretty early, it is produced in high titer, and the other thing about IgG is it's very, very high affinity antibody. And the good news is when you generate IgG, although this test does not indicate immunity, the immune system will produce antibodies against a vi uh, several viral proteins and generate one against the S protein and neutralizing antibodies are uh, against primarily the S protein, which prevent, prevent or block binding to the ACE2 receptor on host cells and prevent infection. In the bottom slide, you see an IgM uh, expression profile. Again, IgM comes up the earliest. Uh, the response is low, it's low affinity. That just means it doesn't bind very tightly. But generally what happens is it comes up early, it's low titer, but we can measure it. And as you can see, both the M and the S protein, uh, the response to M is practically negligible. So. The take home message here is M comes up first, it's in low titer, it's weak affinity, it disappears pretty quickly, whereas IgG comes up a little bit later, it's a very strong response, it's a very high affinity antibody, and basically this is going to be responsible for a lot of the clearance of the virus, uh, especially in the convalescent phase. In the next slide, what you see is just a, a pictogram or a picture of the test, and I'm not gonna go over it in detail, but what you can see is that there are two ports in this little plastic device. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see that detects IgM, and on the right, IgG. The T line is the test line. That contains a stripe of nuclear protein, and that nuclear protein, what's, what's the most important thing about that is, is it's specific of CoV-2. There's a host of other infectious agents out there that are coronaviruses. The issue is they're probably much more prevalent in many respects than CoV-2, even though it's circulating the globe. They cause, um, you know, the flu, they cause the common cold, and the, the, the idea that a lot of other tests that you'll see, they all cross-react. So you're not measuring CoV-2, you're measuring CoV-2 and whatever else is in that, that, in that, in that soup mix. You know, it could be the so-called 229E virus, which is a flu slash a cold virus. It could be um, the HK uh, strain of the virus. So there's several viruses that are very prevalent and the other tests can't distinguish between them. This test can, this nuclear protein or portion thereof, because it's not the, it's a truncated version, detects that specifically. So in this particular test, what you can see is the test line for IgM is negative. There's no stripe. The C line is just simply a control line. It tells you that the test was performed correctly. Now, if we look 
at the right hand side, however, you can see you have a stripe at the T line and also one at the control line. So the test was run correctly, but you're IgG positive. So the interpretation of this test here is the patient would most likely be in the convalescent phase. So they've gone through the early production of IgM. They're now producing IgG. They're well into uh, an infection with GoV2, but hopefully they're coming out the other end. They're producing IgG, hopefully in the convalescent phase. And at some point, their symptoms are going to start to uh, remit at some level, and they're going to start to get better. So that's really the hallmark that the patient is turning the corner and going to get better uh, at some point. Uh, and in the next slide, that's this is just the result interpretation. Again, two lines positive, one line negative, and then there's a couple uh, invalid. Uh, it's uh, pretty hard to screw this test up, but uh, I think we're all familiar with labs and anything can happen. So if we see either of the two on the uh, right-hand side, uh, the test is invalid, and then we have enough sample we can go ahead and simply repeat the test, which we would do. And in the next slide, what you can see here is just um, a brief description of the clinical data that this test uh, has um, generated. So this test has been used at, on about 2 million patients in China. And those patients had a clear diagnosis uh, of coronavirus using uh, um, a panel of symptoms uh, that have developed uh, by the Chinese CDC. So it may, it may have been pneumonia, it may have been headache, it may have been fever. So you include uh, a grouping of symptoms and based on those symptoms, the doctor, the healthcare professional will make a clinical diagnosis. Um, this research was conducted at five institutions and the total cases of, of this small study below were 447. So they actually use this kit. And out of 447, 110 cases out of the 126 that were clinically confirmed were positive. So the, how, I tell you, what's important is how well does the test result uh, uh, predict uh, a clinical case? And the answer to that is 87.3%. And then 62 uh, cases were clinically excluded and they were totally negative. And the specificity there was 100%. That means that if you were clinically negative, this test uh, indeed predicted the fact that you did not produce any antibody and that you were probably a negative and it was confirmed clinically. And in the next slide, what you'll see is um, uh, recent data that just came out was, was really quite interesting in a, in a cohort of 304 patients. So you could, what you could do is actually group this, these patients into three groups that try to get your handle and your arms around some of this data. It's pretty complicated. So again, as I mentioned, PCR positive. They measure the mRNA uh, mostly against the um, open reading frame 1A, 1B, the nuclear protein part one and part two, so N1, N2, and also the M. So they use a, a panel of primers that detect several genes in this virus so that they really uh, can uh, uh, increase the uh, opportunity uh, to pick up positives. But even still, of clinically diagnosed patients, this only picked up 34.5%. So that was 105 out of 34. So what you can see is now let's, they use the uh, rapid test the, uh, that detects IgG and IgM. So of that, IgM picks up 76% of the PCR positive. IgG only picks up 86% of the uh, PCR positive. When, when grouped together, IgM and IgG in group one, they'll pick up 96% of the PCR uh, positive um, patients. So it, it's really uh, pretty um, good when you combine PCR and antibody together. And so the reason why antibody is gonna miss some of these PCR positive samples is because PCR is a very, uh, is a technique that, that generally is used in the early phase and you're not producing antibody generally. So IgG will be negative many times when PCR is positive. Now the data gets much more interesting in group two. These patients were clinically diagnosed with PCR negative. 
but they were antibody positive. And this is another 41.4%. So this tells you that if you add the 41 and the 34, now you have 75% of the patients that are clinically diagnosed, you're actually picking them up. And that 41% is actually better detection in this group than PCR. So PCR actually is at 34% uh, has um, a, a lower detection than the antibody. And, the, and of the IgM, when you look at the group, about 69% were early infection. So that's, that's what we would expect. IgG only 98%, that's late infection. And then of course, if you look at the IgG and the IgM, they account for the 41.4%, that's 100%. And then, uh, so the take home message here is PCI is gonna miss some. Antibody testing, if you do them in conjunction, you'll pick up another 41%. So clinically, it's gonna be more predictive in many cases than PCR when you put them together, it's very predictive. And just briefly on group three, that's that kind of mixed bag group where the patient shows up with fever or pneumonia or some other case and the physician, especially in this environment says, okay, most likely given what's going on, you're COVID. Okay, so we test you for COVID, your PCR and IgG negative. This has really a, been a group that's FUO, the, the classical fever of unknown origin. So you present like you have a COVID infection, but it may be due to strep or staph or some other infectious agent, but it is not COVID. So that group was about 24%. And in the next slide, Uh, what we see here, this was a nice, another nice study uh, with a cohort of 202 healthy patients. And healthy, I meant asymptomatic, and I, I should revise that, uh, or patients with fever. So what they found uh, in this group, so PCR was basically not used or not available. So we're just looking at clinical criteria, the asymptomatic or showed fever. So what we did was uh, they were tested with this test, IgM only. That accounted for 99%, and they were in early infection, IgG only, 98% late infection. And when you looked at them together, a total of 99% of these clinical cases were um, uh, uh, picked up by this particular test. So the conclusion is that, or the conclusion from the study was that uh, the rapid test is clinically useful in the absence of PCR, just because it seemed to be very, very predictive of patients that had the disease and then were clinically positive. And so the, what I would like to say is this, this is one tool in the tool bag of a physician. The physician, the healthcare provider makes the diagnosis. This test doesn't make a diagnosis, but it's a tool that they can use that would hopefully support the symptoms uh, that they're actually seeing when they take the patient history. The next slide. I'd like to pass this off to James White, and he can handle this. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Brent. Much appreciated. So again, what we wanted to kind of demonstrate, as I say, we um, we identified what was the first um, antibody test approved by the Chinese FDA, given that you know um, clearly that's where this has emanated from. So let's make sure that we uh, we have a test that has been gone through the ropes there. So. The test was approved by the Chinese FDA. In fact, it was the first one. And again, one of the things to note here, there's only five antibody tests that have been approved by the FDA. Um, so I've seen this described as the wild, wild east in terms of what's going on over here right now. But the reality is there's only five companies that have had um, an, a, a Chinese FDA approval. So there's a lot, of, a lot of companies that, I think as of April the 1st, they were banned from exporting. So you'll see companies that are selling tests through Europe um, so I think I saw one the other day where they said, you know, it's a, it's a Belgian test, a, a U.S. Belgian test with a clinical trial in Shanghai. So I don't know the Midwest that well, as you can tell from but I'm pretty sure it's not a Shanghai, Ohio. So um, the reality is, I think, you know, that you just have to be very wary of, of, of the quality of some of these tests out there if they haven't even gone through the, the CFDA. Um, Bill, next slide, please. So again, as, as Brent alluded to, this test has been really what I would describe as kind of battle hardened in terms of uh, being used in, in the epicenter. Um, the 50,000 there was a, a classic lost in translation when they first showed me this slide. 
it's 50,000 times 40 because there's 40 kits um, or 40 tests in each kit. So it was used extensively um, in the, uh, the outbreak uh, to begin with. And on the left hand side is a number of institutions now that are using the test all, all over Asia. So again, I think the key here is, you know, we went out and got a test that has an N of 2 million, uh, has peer reviewed journal article data, as you've seen. Um, Dr. Dorval, with all his experience, has been very happy with running it in terms of how it's worked. Um, so again, we wanted to make sure that, you know, in this era of trying to make sure things are validated, then, uh, you know, we, we wanted to come back with something that, uh, that you know, would, would stand up well um, in the US. Next slide, please, Bill. So again, from a US regulatory approval standpoint, um, our manufacturing partner is registered with the US, um, with the FDA, We've sent a, 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 a submission in under the EUA guidelines uh, as of the 22nd of March. So again, we're waiting to hear back from there. But again, to, to give the FDA some credit right now, they're probably being asked to do about 10x amount of work in half the time with the same number of people. So um, I think they're, uh, they're struggling to get some of these things through. But as I say, we're, we're running this test. We validated it in our clear high complexity lab here in the US. We've run over 3,000 samples now. We're seeing a positivity rate around 6%, uh, as you'd anticipate in some of the epicenters like the US, 20%. And that actually gels pretty well with a number I saw recently where saying they believe that probably one in five uh, New Yorkers have, have, have had the virus. So I think it's nice to see when you hear some of that data and how it correlates well um, to Brent's experience with the test. I think we're seeing some you know, some good positives, some good negatives, and some tests in between, and, and the assay is working very well in this environment. So again, it's translated very well in terms of from, I think the good data, you know, Brent showed you from China into what we're seeing now. Anecdotally, with some of the providers we've worked with, um, I was talking again with a gentleman in New York, and he's, he had three positive patients, um, and one of them was IgM, IgG positive, and the other two were IgG, the, the two, they all three gentlemen lived together. Two of the guys who are IgG, they seen symptoms 14 days earlier. So again, he was confident and understood why that was just IgG. The one who was IgM and IgG, he'd come up, he, he'd started showing symptoms six or seven days earlier. So again, I think what we're seeing is it's correlating very well with clinical symptoms. Um, we had another example where um, we were sent um, two samples, there were uh, four samples, two were um, positives one was PCR positive uh, and they'd been um, PCR positive 12 days earlier the, um, the the other patient that came in that was that we measured IgG positive um, was ne negative PCR twice but again um, was living with the um, PCR positive patient so there's an asymptomatic that we picked up with the IgG that to Brent's comment if you're not in that that PCR window, then you may fall out of it. And I think that's where the benefit of using not only the PCR testing, but as I mentioned up front about getting people back to work, looking at, you know, do you have that antibody? Do you have that antidote? And are, you know, what we're trying to do, as Brent's mentioned, we're measuring the exposure to the disease, not the, the positive or negative, which the PCR is doing. So I think when you look at the two tests working kind of in tandem, I think it's a really good outlook. And so what we're trying to do as I mentioned earlier, is work around the good work that's been going on at the state and federal level in terms of the PCR testing, now to add the antibody testing, as I say, but one which has been validated um, in other parts of the world, and then to bring that here, validate it in our own clear high complexity lab as we've done, launch first the serum with our 6,000 phlebotomists around the country, and now today launch the finger stick test, which enables the patient to do that finger stick at home. But more importantly, all the testing remains being done in our um, high complexity lab uh, in Boston. Okay, next slide. So again, in summary, yeah, this is just a, kind of some examples of how you can get access to the kit. Um, on the website, most providers are signing up uh, and ordering the kit themselves. The key is it's an overnight turnaround time. With a serum test, it's, uh, the test gets back to us and within 24 to 48 hours, we're passing the test back. With the um, finger stick test, it'll be the same overnight back to us, but it'll be a 48 hours to 72 hours in terms of turnaround time for that test. So that's the slight difference that we've got there. 
um, the results all get passed back to the provider. So again, everything that we do always goes through providers so we can then make sure that um, the provider is getting the right information, they're ordering, they're, uh, ordering the test and the test is coming back to a, uh, a healthcare professional. Bill, next slide, please. That's well, perfect. So again, just quick, quick summary. You know, as I say, highly validated test that's working extremely well here in the US. Um, uh, we've got a lot of experience in our management team through Brent in particular. Um, we've validated the test. It's working well in terms of when we look at the positivity rate and the negativity in terms of, of the, the uh, cohorts that we're, or people we're testing all around the country. Um, so that's been very, very pleasing to see. And so, as I say, we're very excited to be launching the finger stick which hopefully makes the turnaround time and the ease of use much easier versus trying to get um, phlebotomists going out to, uh, to all these homes as well. So on that note, Bill, let me first of all, thank you again for giving us this opportunity uh, and uh, any questions that, uh, that you guys may have, ha happy to answer them. We're probably more hopefully uh, Brent and myself. <laughs> no, um, good, yeah. good explanation. I, I mean, answered all my questions um, as you guys went through that, uh, but I did want to just clarify um, how important this is like when I was thinking about this in the beginning stages of you know getting a false negative and the impact that could have where let's say somebody you know um, test themselves and they go see their mother and then they have it right and they get their mother in infected or something like that and just just kind of like that the um, the aspect of the, that down you know decision making that could could cause problems down the road but um, there's going to be a lot, I'm already seeing it all. There's going to be a lot of labs out there um, offering this kind of test. And, and obviously um, we wanted to partner with you guys because you have the, um, the labs and you do the analysis at a lab versus at home, which is the big difference. Um, can you kind of talk to that a little bit more and just how you see it important that is um, from your side too? I, uh, you're right. It's very, very important. Um, these tests are simple, uh, and this one is about as simple as you get. You put a, you, you put the sample in the port, you chase it with uh, a couple drops of the running buffer, so to speak, and in 15, 20 minutes later, you get a result. But it's very, very important to do it very carefully because you can generate negatives with this test and you mentioned false negatives if you don't do it right it's it, it's very very important to let the sample go in and really absorb and to do things slowly but methodically and you can really only do that in a controlled environment the other thing is you add, have to add the right sample the right amount and you know while you can do some of these things at home uh, and we ran into this with the hiv test yeah you could do it at home but do you really want the patient to have the result? Because they say, oh my God, you know, I'm infected or whatever. You want the patient to um, view this test in the context of a clinical diagnosis. So it's only, in my opinion, only properly done in a healthcare provider's office when you have the whole picture. We have one little chapter of the story you have the entire book you know the patient you know the symptoms you know what else is going on so i think it's very important especially you know to, to calm the hysteria when people say oh you know you, you're positive to a virus any virus uh, that's a pretty uh that's a pretty chilling um uh, uh relevation for a patient so i think that this is a case where the doctor is uh uh, a diagnostician and helps to um, uh, put it in a context for the patient, but then puts on the psychologist hat to kind of calm it down, put it, put it in the context, and then the plan is, okay, yeah, this is what it is. Let's have a plan to move forward. And I think that's what's really important. So a clinical lab provides the result. The diagnosis is made by a clinician. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I'd add to that is, Again, if you look at um, some data came out of the UK uh, this week showing 90% of, of unfortunately those who passed with COVID-19 in the UK had some kind of underlying uh, medical condition, whether that's cardiovascular, diabetes. Okay, so there's all these things going on. So I think 
you know, even if it's a negative result, I think it's important that the healthcare provider is explaining to patients now the importance of immune health, especially in this time. You know, unfortunately, you know, we're hearing that there's a likelihood that something will come back again, whether it's this or something similar. The importance of immune health and having that conversation with your clients is really critical now. So I think, you know, you've been talking to them about that for many years, I'm sure. But I think right now, I think we've got a window into, you know, people to say, look, the importance of looking after your underlying health has never been more important. So this is one way of get, giving you that opportunity, again, by you having the results to kind of walk them through that with, I'm sure, all the modalities that, that you were talking about before, Bill, to enable all, the, you know, making sure that the US as a whole, we can improve our underlying immune health because that is what is gonna be critical to fighting this along with these other, other kind of social distancing measures. But as a, if, as a nation, if we've got better immune health, we're gonna be better shaped to uh, fight this when it comes around again. I got a few questions. So I'm a little confused. You have the um, blood drop test, which you can send to people to their home, right? And so they're gonna put the blood drop on the kit and then put it back in the mail and mail it back to you guys to look at the stripes, basically. So am I correct on that? So there's, so there's two kits. So there's the blood draw where we send a phlebotomist to the house, or you guys I know have been doing phlebotomy yourselves. Or the other alternative is, is a finger stick kit where they drop um, uh, blood, blood onto three um, spots. And then that comes back to our lab. We take that blood off the card and then run the test with that blood. Okay. So both tests are being run in, the, uh, in our clear high complexity lab. So at home, they're not gonna see the separate straps like a pregnancy test. All they're gonna do is be putting it on, putting it back in the mail and getting it back to you guys and then getting it home. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, guessing when somebody is no longer infectious, that was infected with the virus, a good guess is when they're IG, uh, IgG only positive. Am I right on that? Yes, pri primarily. And I think that I think the discussion is still going on. But generally, if you test somebody and they're IgG positive, um, you can say, okay. For sure, they're in the convalescent phase. What I would what I would recommend would be then to use that as one time point, and then say an infectious cycle. You know, is roughly maybe 14 days. You know, a week or two, anyways. Test them again in 14 days, and if they're IgG positive, you can say that now you know they've been in that convalescent phase for at least two weeks, and at that point they're probably safe to go back to work. Again, um, we're all waiting for some, for some so, guidance as to when you can go back to work, when you can go see your parents again, especially grandparents. And, and I've, I've yet to see any, um, any firm guide. Some people will say it's a week, other people say two weeks. But I think to err on the safe side, perhaps a little bit longer, would, would probably be warranted. So in general, somebody had a PCR positive, they had symptoms, they are two weeks out, it'd be a good time to do the, this test and see if they were IgG only positive at that point, correct? At about 14 days, you're gonna see IgG. What, uh, again, the, I, I cite this uh, article often, an article just came out in Lancet, uh, I think uh, March 23rd. It's kind of hot off the press, if you will. And what they've shown with this particular virus is that the M and the G response is a little bit delayed. And by, by that, I mean IgM is not coming up in the typical three to five days. It's more like eight to 10 days. And for IgG, which normally comes up probably around, you know, week one, maybe eight days, 10 days, it's pushed out more or less to 15 days. And I think this highlights the fact that the CDC has revised their guidance. And they used to say at day 23 post fever that a patient most likely will be IgG positive. But now I think they've pushed it out to day 28. So at day 14, I would expect that you're through M and starting G, but it may be prudent um, to be in the G phase, maybe to test 
on the third week, given what given what the data that's coming out uh, uh, indicates. Yeah, that's what I saw. That it it's a bell curve, but there's still people out at 21 days, for example. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, as far as convalescent serum, I'm kind of going out there a little bit, wondering about who's in a good place to donate convalescent serum. 21 days, IgG positive, uh, I am IG, am negative at that point. They're probably, uh, it's probably a pretty good time to be a convalescent serum donor. Yes, I, 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 guess. I, I, I agree with you. Now, I just want to be careful here. Uh, this test does not predict immunity, but the way the immune system works is that you don't get uh, an antibody against just nuclear protein. You're going to get antibodies against the S1 protein, the M protein, the hemagglutin, and probably some of the other enzymes that are also uh, a part and parcel of this virus. So having said that, the antibodies in the convalescent serum that you really want to get, let's say, meaning they'll generate immunity, are going to be against the spike glycoprotein. And that's the S1 receptor binding domain. And that's the S1 receptor is uh, binds to the ACE2 receptor on host cells and then clipped by another protease and then can gain entry into the cell. So, I just want to be careful to say that. This would indicate that you're in the convalescent phase, and I would say there's a high likelihood that they'd be neutralizing antibodies there, but I don't want to overstate and say, yeah, they should be there. That's something that would have to be tested, but if they were there, they certainly would be beneficial maybe to a immunosuppressed person or an older person that uh, may not be mounting uh, an effective immune response. They might be a nice additive boost. Are you familiar with what the places that are doing convalescent serum are using as their testing and how to know when to take the plasma, for example, which as, as you just said, the plasma has more things in it besides the yeah. antibody. So it, you know, there's probably more benefit than just that. But nevertheless, do you know what they're using? Are they using your test? Are they using a different test? Guessing? I what are they doing? I think what they do is they measure, if I were doing it, I don't know exactly what the protocol is for that, but I know what they've done for other viruses in general. What you want to do is you'll measure and you'll say, okay, this is convalescent serum uh, or plasma, as you stated. That's what they use, really, plasma, not serum. Um, and so what you do is then you would test that on a second test and show that it neutralized the virus. So you use it on a live virus assay and to show that it decreased the infectivity of the virus and if you, or the multiplicity of infection, they call it. And if you can show that the convalescent serum decreases the effectiveness of that virus to infect a cell in a laboratory dish, that's a live virus assay, then you'd say, okay, we have neutralizing antibodies here. This is a good uh, plasma. Uh, it should be efficacious if we give it to a patient. So I think a follow-on assay is used for that, much like the polio virus and for, for other viruses like that. That's, that sounds good, yeah. Good job, guys. Uh, I think you've got something that's uh, very worthwhile. Uh, I do want to talk to you all briefly after this recording uh, about a thing uh, related. Right. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, gentlemen. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, we're right at an hour, so that's good. Um, but yeah, if you just got just a second. So um, thank you very much. And this is very useful information. Looking forward to getting this country back to work, like you said, and um, being healthier than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Let me know when the recording's off. Are you still recording, Bill?